plus or minus a year and one for price within a 30% range, 15% above and 15% below. There's a poll up right now, which asking you what is in your glass this evening. And we're gonna ask our critics too. So let's introduce our critics for this evening. Joining us tonight, we have David Larson. Hello, David, thank you for joining us. My pleasure to be here, um, last of the season, but hopefully not the last. <laughs> delighted to be here, I have fun tonight, folks. Thank you. We also have John Zavo. Hi, lovely people. Thanks for joining us yet again. Yes, last for the season, but we'll be around for other events during the summer. And yes, we'll be back in the fall. We're counting on it. Fantastic. And we also have Michael Goodell. Welcome, Michael. Evening, Renee, and welcome, everyone. Glad to see everybody again. Well, I can't exactly see you, but I'm happy you're here for the season finale. Hopefully, uh, we'll get some entertainment uh, in the show tonight. Thank you so much. And we also have Sarah D'Amato. Sarah, thank you for joining us this evening. Hey, you know, it's great to be here for our last episode for a while. We're going to get let everyone enjoy the sunshine and the summer. And uh, as David mentioned, in the fall, we'll likely be back at it again. We definitely will be. I'm so excited about that. Just to all of our audience members at home, a reminder to you guys, if you would like to see our critics in full form, you can change your view to gallery view so you can see all of them. And if you have any questions this evening, to please put them in the question and answer box. And this is your first reminder at the top of the hour to please not give away any hints to our critics this evening. Now let's find out what's in our critics glass. Sarah, what are you drinking this evening to kick your night off? Yeah, so here is a uh, wine that I actually brought back from Portugal. I was missing the country very much. This is uh, a wine from Dao. It looks like a red wine, but it's actually a white. It's from Casa de Passarela. It's the Abanico Branco, which is um, it's a, largely a blend of whites focusing on Encruzado, which is one of my all-time favorite white varieties. Um, we haven't had it on the show yet, but who knows? Maybe we'll get it at one point. Maybe we'll get it today. <laughs> Probably not, but this is a really fascinating estate from the Serra da Estrela region. So higher up in the mountains of the Dow, about 600 meters in altitude. So it's a lot fresher. They make reds from like Torriga Nacional and these, these, bigger, uh, these bigger grapes generally that you find the Duro, but here they're a lot more subtle and a lot more refreshing. And so is this Encruzado aged in a little bit of oak, but uh, perfect to kick off the night, I think. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm going to go over to David. David, what's in your glass this evening? Well, it's a lovely Chardonnay. You may be well aware that uh, Thursday was uh, International Chardonnay Day. Uh, the only problem with International Chardonnay Day was too short. Uh, it needs to be a week. Uh, so I tasted about 20 wines that day. We were tasting at the office. Many of them were Chardonnays and tasting some at home as well. Uh, and I've got a little gem here from the Ottawa Valley. There's a new winery called Kin Vineyards. Uh, they've planted Chardonnay and Pinot Noir on Carp Ridge, which is a limestone ridge on the south side of the river. Um, and a really great winemaker named Brian Hamilton is uh, doing some excellent work with, with these. So get ready, Ottawa Valley will be our next region. Uh, just before I, I pass it off, I just want to mention uh, the Tempranillo Happy Hour. Oh, that, David, that, I'm sorry, before you do that, can you please give the bottle with you? Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Thank you. Sorry, I know people are dying to it know. It doesn't show up well in my light here, but Kin Vineyard. Okay. Thank you, David. Yeah. So next week, uh, uh, John and I will be back actually doing a Tempranillo happy hour with the wines from the uh, Familia Fernandez Rivera. Uh, you may not know that name, but wine collectors will certainly know the name of their most famous wine, Pescara. So it's a great story of traditional uh, Tempranillo. So I'm looking forward to that. Beautiful Ribera del Dero production. And you guys will see in the, the chat uh, a link where you can find your tickets for that as well. We're going to go over to John. John, what are you drinking this evening? What's in your glass? Renee, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of homework over here. I have to admit I'm researching Croatian wines. I'll tell you why in a second, but I'm drinking this pretty fascinating Malvasia Istarka from the Istrian Peninsula from the winemaker there, Kabbala, you can see. And it's an amphora aged, skin fermented, skin contact white wine aged in amphora, so very, very hip. 
also very, very ancient <laughs> and really quite fascinating. Mavazi is a, an aromatic variety. And do yourself a favor, Google the Istrian Peninsula and the Dalmatian coast, because it has to be one of the most beautiful parts of Europe. This peninsula juts out into the Adriatic, and the soils there are either stark white or deep red terra rossa. So lots of interesting uh, soil stories there. And uh, I say research and homework because, uh, well, we'll be back in a couple of weeks on June 12th. We're doing a Croatian happy hour, which I'm really excited about. You won't probably many of you won't have tasted too many Croatian wines. They, they drink more than they actually produce, so a tiny amount is exported. But there's a new importer here in Ontario who's working hard to get these old world wines with tremendous history better known in the province. And all of us, the Wine Line crew, we tasted through uh, about 20, 25 wines uh, not so long ago. And I can tell you, we were all just riveted by the quality. These are higher end wines. These are not inexpensive wines, but boy, are they worth discovering. Uh, weird varieties like Poship and Plavac Mali and Malvasia and Tehran and, and so on and so forth. So do join us on the on the 12th if you're interested. We do have a couple of um, packs to taste along, either three or you can do the full Monty and get six bottles, which I will be tasting along with our dear colleague Janet Dorazinski, also a wine line judge from Ottawa who spent a lot of time in Croatia. So the two of us will be spending that happy hour together, hopefully with lots of you. So cheers. It's so exciting, guys. Creation Wine is a beautiful place to check out. Really lovely in the glass. And before we move on to Michael, Sarah, there is a question that's come. Can you please type out that Portuguese wine that you're drinking into the chat for our wonderful audiences exactly. today? I'm typing it out right now. <laughs> Fantastic. And then we're going to go over to Michael. Michael, what is in your glass this evening? What are you drinking? Well, I won't forget, Renee. Thank you for asking. And I'll put the bottle up right away. Oh, you have one of my oh, favorites. I am drinking a Vernaccia di San Gimignano. Tuscan wine, close to your heart for sure. Uh, oh. This is from uh, Il Colombaio di Santa Chiara. It's their Selva Bianca 2019. And I'll tell you a little secret about, about um, Tuscans. Well, well specifically uh, the people who live in Chianti Classico. So there's a ridge in Chianti Classico called San Donato in Poggio, well, the village as well in this ridge. And if you stand at the top of this ridge, you can see in, on a clear day, you can see the towers of San Gimignano up to the northwest. In fact, there are many places in, in that part of the region that you can see uh, and vice versa. But the little secret here is that they won't tell you this, but uh, people in Chianti Classico, when they're making barbecue, when they're actually standing outside and grilling like we do here, and they want, a, you know, they want some white wine, well, they're not going to drink Sangiovese, obviously. So Veramentino is the obvious answer, but... I know a few who will drink a Vernaccia di San Gimignano. You know, they won't, let, they won't let anybody know that they're doing it, but that's the definite barbecue wine in Chianti Classico, which segues me to barbecue wines in Canada. This would work really well, beautiful wine. Um, but uh, Wine Align Exchange, which is, you know, what the four of us do is we taste wines every week at the office. And we are, you know, rigorous process where we, we taste dozens of wines and only pick one here and there that we that we all agree upon that should go into a wine alone case. So the barbecue case is, uh, I believe, getting close to selling out, maybe a dozen cases left, but uh, fantastic barbecue wines in there. I uh, ships probably in June, if that makes sense, everybody. And um, get on it because they'll they'll be gone quick. Oh, fantastic. And uh, Michael, if you just want to put the name of that wine in the chat, I know it is available in Ontario. Fantastic. And we have uh, the barbecue wines, the Croatian wines, and the family Rivera Fernandez. Uh, Fernandez Rivera, sorry. Uh, hey, links in our chat as well. So you guys can all find that on Wine Align. They have amazing, amazing projects coming out. But we are going to kick off this evening for our critics takeover on our very last episode and we're going to be sending only a couple of our critics away david is going to be staying back with me first we're going to be saying goodbye to john michael and sarah for a quick moment as they head into the critics lounge critics if you could just show everybody the little bottles and pour them into your glasses i'm actually going to be doing the same this evening and david has the bag of mystery tonight Amazing. So David, we're just going to wait for everyone to head out. Fantastic. All right. Apparently I started pouring a little bit too late. Let me just start sharing my screen here, everyone. And uh, David, you can keep the wine in the bag for now because we'll have a, we have a beautiful picture of your wine up on the screen. 
So David, this is your wine for the evening. Can you tell everybody uh, just what they're seeing up here, the name of the wine and uh, what- Okay, what so this is the Jean-Max Roger Cuvée Jeunesse uh, Sancerre uh, in the Loire Valley of France, grape variety of Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, it's the only white grape grown in this area. Um, it's uh, a lovely wine, it's a classic. This is a really great family producer. Uh, makes very complex wines. And I'll maybe tell you a little later, I mean, I suspect that our critics will, will probably get the region and the grape, um, but they may, they may have a little bit of trouble because this is actually a very complex wine. It's not as obvious as, as uh, you might think. It's, it's not your straight up uh, sort of Marlboro, New Zealand Sauvignon. There's some complexities going on here. Fantastic. I'm just going to pull this down right away, everyone. We're going to get our critics to come back in the room. They've had a little bit of time to check out with the wine in the glass already. And remember everyone joining us this evening to please not give our three remaining critics any, any inkling of what this wine is for this evening. So we're gonna, we're gonna throw it over to John first. John, what are you? <laughs> Oh, what are your first thoughts on wine number one? I'm still working, Renee, but okay, since you insist. You're still, you're, you, you still got tons of time. It's just your first thoughts. Can I just say that I love these uh, Critics' Choice versions? I mean, we're delighted to have sponsors for obvious reasons, but man, you know, when we're all tasting what everyone else wants to be drinking, it generally works out well in your glass. And I love what you've picked here, David. I'm not sure what it is yet, but uh, I'm working through it. Vibrant, fresh, unoaked bright acids, crunchy on the palate. Seems like it's gonna be a, a kind of light and easy going wine, but then you get it on your palate and it sits and it lingers and it's still there and it's still there. And it, I can still taste it right now Absolutely. with this wonderful kind of green apple, citrus blossom, daffodil like finished subtle. Um, wow, delicious, thank you. This is making my aperitif hour all the happier at the moment. Now, what is it? Did no, I get John, much? that's yeah, your no. job. Yeah, <laughs> We'll get back to you in a little bit, John. We're going to go over to Sarah. Sarah, what are your first thoughts on wine number one? Mute, I'm sorry, muted. Sarah, you're on mute. Oh, see, this is the last day and I forget to unmute myself. Um, I, I echo John's thoughts on the fact that it's quite refreshing. Thank you very much, David. Um, this is a great summertime white. It's not too heavy. It's um, got these beautiful kind of scintillating acidity about it. A little bit of minerality. I thought maybe, maybe there would, might be some older wood, certainly nothing new um, here. Um, it's salty. It's got mineral to it, but it's, um, it's really dominated by these bright citrus flavors and these subtle hints of white flower and um, yeah, that, this is very refreshing sip. Fantastic. And Michael, what are your first thoughts on wine number one, David's wine? What they said. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> I mean, pretty much. They're right. White flowers, honeysuckle, there's a saltiness to it. Uh, to me, there's, a, there's an old world charm here. Uh, there's some marine air that's blowing in that's affecting this wine. So, uh, and yet at the same time, there seems to be some kind of some kind of mountainous influence as well. So I'm thinking of a of a of a of a, a grape variety in in old world Europe that um, is affected by both by both an ocean influence and an elevation influence, and it's just fresh and lovely. I love it. Michael, given all the hints over there, it's very very nice. I gave you, you. Didn't I? <laughs> all right, let's let's swing back around. David, are you ready to find out what what your colleagues? think wine number one sure, is. Yeah, no, I and love I'm their descriptions. You know, these these folks are pretty good writers. So that's uh, one, one of the things you're going to enjoy when you read wine line reviews. There's some pretty good writing going on. Very descriptive. Amazing. So we're going right back to John. John, what is wine number one? I'm going to tell you, but I, I just wanted to say I appreciate Michael's efforts to throw us off piste, you know, he's in the mountains, he's by the sea, he's Mari Monti, he could have thrown in a plane in between there just to, you know, cover all of the topography possible. Um, I'll tell you what, there's one thing that kind of shifted me at the final moment. I'll tell you, I think this is a, a wine grown on limestone first, and then after that I had to kind of work backwards to the variety. So I tell you what, I was in Chablis, but then I picked up a little note of um, a little peppery pyrazine green pepper, so I'm going to shift 
not too far away, a few kilometers to the west to Sancerre. I think this is Sauvignon Blanc based, youthful 2019, good quality Sauvignon Blanc Sancerre from France. And you're gonna pay folks uh, easily $30 for this wine. Fantastic, John, thank you very much. And we're gonna go over to Sarah. Sarah, what is wine number one? You know, as John said, it's a tough call. Is it Sauvignon Blanc or is it Chardonnay? And I think the fact that there's very little discernible oak and I was really trying to find maybe some old cast or something in there, but also it's just such high, so high in acid and it's got this grapefruit thing. So um, I, I've also thought it's perhaps Sauvignon Blanc and, um, and uh, Puis Fumé. So we'll be right next to Sancerre there. And something quite fresh, a new vintage, um, maybe not the 2020s out just yet, but 2019. And um, I will put the price at $25. Thank you very much, Sarah. And we are going to go over to Michael. Michael, what is wine number one? Well, first thing is, I think uh, I have to say about John, I don't think he's going to let objectivity nudge him off the pillar of his own perspective here. So I think I'm going to have to follow his and also Sarah's perspective. Don't, because don't do it. Don't do it. Don't recommend right. <laughs> I think they're absolutely right that this is Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, I can't shake that, um, despite the ocean and mountain comments I made. Um, uh, but I think it is from, I think it is a Touraine. I don't think it's quite Sancerre. I think it's a it's a Touraine that that punches above its weight like no other. So uh, Sauvignon Blanc, France, Touraine, Loire Valley, and um, I'd say it's nineteen dollars. Okay, great, fantastic. And you, I'm sorry, what was the vintage you said again? Oh, I didn't, but I'll tell you again, not that I did it before, 2019. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Michael. All right, David, are you ready? We got our drum roll going. What is wine number one? Can you show our everybody else, please? Ready, ready to reveal, but I just got to put a plug in for Sarah's wine mystery bags. Well done, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> and the Four wine the is... The only ones in the world. <laughs> Haha. Jean-Max Roger, Sancerre, 2019. Uh, I think price was 33 Thirty three ninety five yeah. is the price. Two thousand nineteen, lovely wine. So, um, I, I before you get into the wine, David, I'm just yeah. going to get our scoring wizard to bring okay, up yes, the scores right away yeah. and see how everyone did on this round. Scoring wizard, if you could please start sharing your screen with us. Fantastic. So, John, you got a perfect score this round. Congratulations to you. But Michael, what about the hair? Sarah, don't I get an extra point? No, <laughs> sorry, you don't. I'm sorry, you don't. We 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 talked. The scoring wizard and I talked. You don't get extra point for the hair. But Sarah and Michael also got eight. So this, we're starting off the round really strong. Thank you very much, Scoring Wizard. And back over to you, David, please. Yeah, uh, good. Well, well done, guys. Um, I, I really didn't figure you'd have too much trouble getting the grape variety uh, and, and the, the region. I mean, it's uh, definitely sort of a French style. There's a certain elegance to it. Uh, but I, I was delighted to see you floundering around a little bit at the beginning uh, with uh, whether or not it was Chardonnay and whether there was barrel. Uh, there is no barrel here, but but this producer uh, does age his Sancerres on the lees for the duration of, of their aging. So that's what's giving it that, that kind of so toasty, richer, more complex um, flavor and, and texture. And that's what I was hoping would, would trip you up. And it almost did, but you're good. So I uh, love this wine. It, it was just in the May 15th release. It's, there's still plenty of it on the shelf. And um, this producer, uh, has been, been been sending great wine through into Ontario for as long as I can remember tasting. So should be pretty familiar with it. Really good stuff. Fantastic. You guys did a really great job this round. We do have a couple of questions that's come in from our audience before we move on to our next wine for the night. And we got our first question up, which is, what does crunchy on the palate mean? And John, you apparently mentioned this. So John, can you please explain? Just imagine the sensation of biting into like a turgid green apple or green grape you know you get that crunch you get that pop of acidity that freshness that vibrancy you know crunchy is a textural descriptor but it often refers to acidity as well but just it, for me it's an imagination of of that biting into that crunchy appley type uh, experience fantastic we also had a question come up about what 
how does limestone soils really start to showcase in wine? Sarah, I know you also mentioned that you were going back and forth between Chablis and somewhere within the Valley of Loire. Was the soil what was kind of bringing you there? And if so, like, how do you describe that in the glass? Yeah, so the limestone soils coupled with a cooler climate, giving high acidity to the wine, do give you um, this kind of sometimes, and in, in particular areas like this, uh, chalky minerality, not directly from the soil, but I have to say that wines that are higher in acid, that are fresher, that have been less manipulated by winemaking, tend to show that characteristic more so. And I think this is um, what we all found in this particular wine, that nice flintiness. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely part of the wine. We have our last question that I'm going to throw over to Michael, and then we're going to move on to uh, wine number two, which is, Michael, are Sancerre's allowed to be barrel-aged? Absolutely. Uh, there, there's no rule against it. Um, it's just that that a, a little too much barrel, a little too much wood is going to cover up that, you know, that coyote soil, that the white chalky calcium carbonate soil, limestone soil that, that really gets into the wine and makes for this high acid crunchiness that John's talking about. If you barrel age, you're likely to cover that up a little bit with some creaminess and some nuttiness and, and then it would just confuse us more and we'd all think it was from, from Bourgogne or from Chablis. Exactly. Well, great selection this evening, David. Thank you so much for your wonderful selection for wine number one. And we are going to kick off to wine number two, which means John is going to be staying back with me. All other critics, if you could please just showcase your vials of mystery for everyone and pour them into the glass. We're going to be sending you off to the critics lounge. And John, you're going to be hanging back with me. This is so exciting. We get to do this so infrequently. Yay! <laughs> You don't get to be shut away. And also now that they're all over there, okay, when, now I saw I can what this wine was, when I saw what this wine was, I'm gonna start sharing my screen in just a, uh, right now as well. I knew that you picked this wine. This How is did you such know a that, wine. Eh? John, can you please tell everyone what they're seeing up here on the screen and what the, just the, the what the wine <laughs> is this evening that your colleagues will be trying to figure out in the glass? So the somewhat challenging one that I have selected for the others to uh, to taste through is this Turk Reed Obera Kremser San Grube Reserve Grüne Vertlina. I mean, that is a big mouthful of wine and it is a big mouthful of wine in, in every sense. So we're in Austria. We're in the Creme Valley, which is just a little bit west of Vienna uh, along the Danube River. So there are three important appellations there. There's the Wachau, Kremstal, and Kamptal, three brilliant places where the world's best Gruner Veltliner grows. So that's the great variety, the flagship of Austria. One third of all plantings of vineyards in Austria are this variety. And Turk, uh, Franz Turk is a, is a multi-generational 300 year family operation, small hands-on Gruner Veltliner specialist. This came uh, through vintages uh, not so long ago, I think the beginning of May, May 2nd. And uh, we all loved it. I certainly loved it. And to be perfectly honest, there wasn't a ton of this left. There were maybe only 300 bottles when I selected it earlier this week, but I, I just really wanted to drink it again. Uh, so I'm glad uh, you got a little taste of it too, but I hope people manage to find a little, uh, little supply of it in their local LCBOs. Cause it's for me, classic Gruner Veltliner, which I'm going to say it's not an easy variety to guess. The first time I ever got a Gruner right in a blind tasting uh, was about 20 years ago. I was chuffed with myself. And since then, I've mistaken it for Pinot Gris and for Albarino and for a host of other varieties. So it's, it's, oh, it'll be interesting to see how, uh, how yeah. my friends do with this. Let's see, let's see how the rest of the critics do. And hopefully they also guess that it is the 2017 vintage and 34.95. So to stop sharing my screen there. We're going to bring our critics back into the room. Remember, everyone, please do not give any hints to our critics. We have a very good wine coming up and we are going to really get everyone to come back in. Everyone, if you could just, all of our critics joining us back, please take yourselves off of mute. And I am gonna go over to Sarah first. Sarah, what are your first thoughts on wine number two? Yeah, so wine number two is a pretty floral wine. It's a very aromatic style. And so, you know, there, which is very nice of John because there really narrows down the varieties that this could be. It's still more than one for sure, but um, there are some distinctive characters here, floral, rose petal in particular that I'm noticing, um, peach blossom, 
uh, that uh, that could be the variety. On the palate, there's almost an, a hint of sweetness, almost like an impression of sweetness, perhaps not a lot of residual sugar, but just this perception of sweetness from the fruit, which is really pretty and elegant. Um, and there's a nice balance here between some warmth on the, the finish and some brightness on the palate. So I really like this. You know, can I share a funny story, though, that, you know, when, when John found out we were doing this, he sent an email out to everybody saying, OK, Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc for everyone. <laughs> so I half expected him to maybe throw in the Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc. Here. Well, David did the Sauvignon Blanc on this. This I don't think is a Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc. Um, but uh, it's something nicely representative. Fantastic. And you know, he was nice last time. So let's see how nice he's going to be this time with his sherry selection. So we're, we're going to go over to Michael. Michael, what are your first thoughts on wine number two? Oh, this wine feels feels very close to my heart. I, I'm, uh, I'm really happy that John chose this. I think this is a very generous uh, uh, choice that he has made. My first thought was that there was no oak on this wine, that it was fresh and crisp with this green apple bite. Um, but also this kind of herbal pesto to it. But then I put it in my mouth and I got, I got this gluck. I don't know if anybody knows the word gluck. It's with the umlaut over the I feel over, like you're going to have to explain it. I feel it's, like well, it's this, it. it's this feeling of oiliness on the palate in a wine, but it's not truly viscous or oily. It just as gives you the, the imaginative, imaginative impression of that. So then I realized, you know what, there's some pretty, there's some barrel on this. And, and then it, it, it went a little, it reminded me that it actually is a little bit of reductive flintiness. And so I'm pretty sure I know where I'm going with this. I've got a first impression and I'm not going to waver from it. Um, but that's about all I have to say about that. <laughs> Amazing. And we're going to go over to David. David, what are your first thoughts on wine number two? Well, lovely. Uh, great selection, John. Thank you. It's, it's actually a very sophisticated wine. Um, Sarah's right. It's got this lovely sort of floor. There's lots of fruit here. Um, there is a little bit of oak. There's a little, little bit of reduction, flintiness. Um, it's very complex and, and it's really well balanced. Again, some, some sense of richness texturally on the palate but lively acidity, minerality, even a little bit of spritz almost in there that's, that's sort of giving it some jump. Uh, it's not sparkling or anything like that, but there's just a, a liveliness to the wine that, that's, that's really sort of lifting the palate. So a lot of elements here. Um, it's complex. Uh, the length is very good. Um, really enjoying it. Fantastic. You guys seem confident. So we're gonna go back over to Sarah. Sarah, what is wine number two? Well, um, you know what, at first I had I, uh, I was a little tricked to thinking that this might be um, a completely different variety than I'm going to say, but I think it, it's Gewürztraminer, I'm going to say. Um, and given that florality, given the slight warmth, given that little bit of viscosity here, um, but still having this nice brightness. So I'm going to say, not 100% not confidently, that um, it's possibly Gewürztraminer and uh, given the fact that it's also not uber sweet, uh, but has that weight, I'll say Alsace, France, um, 2019, and the price being $29. Thank you so very much, Sarah. We're going to go back over to Michael. Michael, what is wine number two? So I will tell you, Sarah, that I, all, I also think it's Gewürztraminer, but there is part of me that thinks it's also Chardonnay. And I'll tell you why, because I think the sense of place is much greater than the sense of grape variety. So I'm going to have to make a decision on which yes, one I think it is. But I'm actually going to go with Sarah and I'm going to say Gewürztraminer because I think that's what it is. But I think the reason there's a Chardonnay element to it to me is that it's local. I think it's from Niagara, Niagara Peninsula specifically. Um, I think it's really, really young. So I'm going to say 2020. And I think it's a great deal at $20. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Michael. And we have David. David, what is wine number two? Well, thank you, Michael, for sort of mapping this out a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to go the Gewürztraminer route, um, but I am going to go the Chardonnay route. Uh, but it's, it is more fruit driven. There's more fruit aroma than you normally get from Chardonnay. So I think it's from a pretty warm year. It's almost, almost tropical. 
And I started to think about uh, California, but but the texture is not California. The acid's too too firm. Uh, there's the minerality. So I was left with either Burgundy or Niagara, uh, and I'm still not convinced either way. But what I am going to do is go to Burgundy, and uh, I'm going to go to the 2018 vintage. It's it's a what I, they call a regional appellation, so it's not basic Burgoyne. I think it may be like Haute Cote de Bone, something like that. I don't think it has quite the, the depth to be a Merceau or a village wine. So somewhere in between, but a really good example. Uh, about $30. Uh, I think that covers it, right? You covered all of it. You okay. did. You definitely yeah. covered all of it. John, are, are you ready for your big reveal for what wine number two is? All right, John, go right ahead. Please reveal our wine this evening. <laughs> I'll just remind everyone that remember I did pick an Amontillado Sherry the last time we did this round, which was, you know, a gift. This one I knew would be a little bit tougher, but if you triangulate stylistically Niagara, Alsace, and Burgundy, you might just end up in Austria drinking Gruner Wettliner from okay. the Kremstahl <laughs> from a warm vintage 2017, which is what, 3495, I, I think. Yeah, 3495, 2017 was the vintage, yes. Well, it certainly was peppery. Yeah. Not, not, not easy. I mean, I was telling the crowd while you were in the critics lounge that, uh, you know, I was so excited when I was when I first identified a Grunewald Liener in a blind tasting, and then since then I've messed it up a thousand and one times. But it, I mean, shall I go on now? You want to bring up the scoring wizard? Yeah, today, we're going to bring up the scoring wizard at this moment. Thank you. Scoring wizard, can you please start sharing your screen and see how our critics did for this round? Sarah. <laughs> Not well. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Michael. That's right. Uh, you know what, David? You are the winner of this round with a Whoa. two points. With it's two really points. Lovely. Yes, it, it was very, very good of you. And uh, Sarah, you've made it onto the board. Um, I, I, scoring Wizard, you guys can pull that down. Uh, yes, John does have a good poker face. I was trying to keep my nodding as good as possible the entire time as well. But John, please go right ahead. And anybody, if you do have any questions this evening to just put them in the questions and answer area and we will definitely get those answers. So John, please continue your point. I confess it was a little underhanded of me to slide that one in there, but knowing what it is now, I think you all agree it's a pretty classic yeah. example, yeah, not just a Gruner Wettliner from Austria, but from Lus soils, this particular windblown soil that accumulates up the Danube Valley, comes in from Hungary, but you get literally meters thick of the stuff, and Gruner loves this soil type, it needs this generous root environment, and that leads to this rich round creamy texture. I'm not 100% sure about the barrel aging. I don't think there's any here, yeah. but uh, I see why. And there's certainly lots of leaves aging, which gives it that, that creamy texture as well. And I love the, the Gluck because there's lots of Gluck here. And I don't think there's any residual sugar, but there's an impression of roundness and sweetness on the palate, which for me is pretty typical of Grunewald Liner in Lus soils. So uh, yeah, a tough wine for sure, but uh, but a pretty good example of what it is. But uh, I don't know, we'll hear from the rest. Yeah, I do figure that I mention a word with an umlaut in it and don't pick Austria. I, I was I, I figured you were you were somewhere there, you know, east of, of the Alps. But we were so rooting for you. We were we were rooting for all of you. Okay, so I'm going to go over to Sarah because you said something very specific after, and this question I feel like has to do with it. Sarah, what is the telltale trait of a Gruner Veltliner? Well, you know, there are, a, there are a few. And as John mentioned, it can be a little tricky sometimes because some Gruners can be quite subtle. And I find that, you know, Gruners above a particular price point tend to so, show more varietal character. Um, but that peppery note um, is, is sometimes a, a giveaway and that flintiness. Um, refreshing acidity that you uh, you definitely notice in a in a Gruner Veltliner, and um, sometimes uh, almonds like slivered blanched almond you you sometimes get that characteristic in Gruner Veltliner as well too, and they can be confused for other wines very easily, but uh, it's it's more aromatic than a Chardonnay. Yeah, no, definitely so. It's a really, really beautiful selection and they are, they can be confusing wines. Uh, but Sarah mentioned all of the wonderful telltale signs of that. We have a, another question. Uh, David, I think you had mentioned this as well. No, I'm not entirely sure. I'm just going to go, I'm just going to ask you this question, David. Where in the, where else in the world can you find Gruner Veltliner? 
Well, it's a variety that's really catching on internationally. It's not huge yet, but for about 20 years, so people have been very interested in, in growing it. Um, there is a fair bit now being done in New Zealand, particularly in the, on the North Island. Um, there is uh, there are sev several, maybe half a dozen varieties or so uh, coming out of the Okanagan Valley in BC. Uh, you're, you're finding it popping up in any regions that are sort of dealing with cool to moderate climate white wines. Everyone's experimenting with it. Austria is still doing the best all, all around, of course, but um, I'm, I, I was very curious to find uh, gruners from elsewhere. It's really cool to start to see this grape become a world traveling grape varietal, that is for sure. And I'm also going to take our next question to Michael. Michael, you mentioned Gluck before, which is that oily kind of texture that can be in a wine. The reason why I'm saying it is, again, because I see it a lot in our chat right now. Um, but I would like you, if you could please do a food pairing for this wine that would consider this interesting oily texture that's being presented in the glass. So... Believe it, I, I think Gruner is one of those grape varieties that actually goes with asparagus. There are not very many. And um, at this time of year, Ontario asparagus is absolutely divine. And so um, I'd say it's like a nice little piece of grilled salmon and some lightly blanched asparagus, maybe a list, a little bit of, of aioli or some kind of, some kind of uh, dressing to go with it. But to me, keep it simple. And uh, and Gruner, and this particular Gruner for sure, because of that, because of that texture and that unctuousness that it has, I think. Uh, there you go. Perfect. Bl Blanche greens, if not, it doesn't have to be asparagus, but definitely a, a, a green veg kind of yeah. uh, and and light light uh, light protein, not too salty. Works Just well. have like a green bean salad with a green bean puree, some asparagus on top. Why don't we throw some sprouts Beautiful. in there? It'll Soise, be a great day. something like that. Also would be Perfect great. Perfect day. And I'm going to have uh, one more question. We're going to go back over to John for this one before we go on to wine number three. And it is because you selected this wine. Is this a drink now, Gruner, or a possible age, Gruner? Yes, yes. Uh, I think it's. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's quite <laughs> quite delicious now. If you like wines more on the fruit, this is just uh, it's singing opulent fruit, very ripe, as it's all been discussed. But uh, Gruner's actually aged surprisingly well. There's a lot of substance here. There's a lot of dry extract. There's that underlying acidity, all of which will hold it together. You know, you don't need to wait 50 years for this, of course. But I would comfortably tuck this in the cellar till the end of the decade and and pull it out with confidence. So yeah, either either or. Thank you so much. And John, good selection on the wine as well. You guys have uh, it's really done well this, this, this round. I'm so excited about it. But we are going to our wine number three. Michael, you're going to be hanging back with me. But David, uh, Sarah, and John, if you guys can pull out your next little vials of mystery. and Thanks for the rosé, Michael. Yeah, yeah. The mystery <laughs> rosé. Enjoy. Uh, we're going to let them head into the Critics' Lounge. And yeah, yeah, Michael taunting with the bottle. And this is definitely gonna happen. All right, Michael, I let me get our, our share screen going and you can tell our wonderful audience what wine you have selected. Have you, have you been kind with your rosé? I, I feel like we're a little on the fence. <laughs> yeah, I think I've been kind with it. I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't think, I think that um, there's, a, there's an idiosyncratic aspect to this wine that everyone will will notice and it will take them elsewhere. They've all tasted it. And so I think someone's gonna get it. And if it's someone who goes first or second, they'll lead someone else on. But amazing. It's, this is an amazing wine. So George Skouras from the Peloponnese in Greece um, is one of Greece's and the world's most experimental winemakers. He's way ahead of trends and what's hip and, and all this. So three grape varieties, uh, a blend of Ioritico endemic to, to Greece, to, especially to the Peloponnese, um, which is raised in acacia barrel, Saran stainless tank, and Mavro Filero in Amphora. It's like three grapes, three different ways to raise them brought together. As I said, it's idiosyncratic. You have to use your imagination, but there's so much knowledge and texture and interest in here. And I mean, I know they all really like this wine. And hopefully they will also get that it is from the 2019 vintage and is $29.95. But we are going to get our critics to come back into the room and see how they are doing. And remember, everyone, uh, please do not give any hints away to our critics. We want them to work as hard as possible. And that is the best thing for them to do. 
Hello, critics. Welcome back. Please unmute yourself so that we can talk to you freely. And I am going to go over to David first. David, what are your first thoughts on wine number three? My first thought that this is a varietal of concern. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and it always is with rosés. I mean, uh, what, what generally happens with rosé is, yes, you there are certain grapes that are used, but because they're not fully fermented sort of on the skins, the ar aromatics of the variety don't show as, as easily. So uh, that's always troubling with rosé, which is why I thank Michael for doing this. <laughs> um, but otherwise, I really like it. It's quite an unusual one, actually. Um, it's got lots of uh, freshness, brightness. Um, there's a herbal note to it that's taking me to a certain grape. Um, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really brisk. It's fresh. There's just a little hint of balancing sweetness. Uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't even call it off dry, but I think in rosé, you always need a little bit of that. Um, and the length is very good. So I'm really enjoying it. Fantastic. Thank you, David. And we're going to go over to John. John, what are your first thoughts on wine number three? First thoughts when I saw the vial were, oh, thank you, Michael. Because I mean, if this doesn't look like Provence rosé, then what does? Pale, delicate color. I mean, it's just. And now that you've tried the wine? And then I thought, God damn that Michael Goodell, he's thrown us yet another curve. So it's not rosé from Friuli, I'm pretty sure this time, but it's an unusual rosé. I mean, for me, it's a rosé in multi-speeds. There's a lot happening here. It's not like a fixie rosé. For those of you who ride bikes, you might get that uh, analogy. There are either multiple varieties or multiple techniques applied to the same variety to get this mix of uh, creamy on the one hand, but then this tart red currant cranberry acid on the other. There's tangerine, there's, there's zest, there's this sweet herbal note that David mentioned. Perfumed, it's aromatic. There might even be a little bit of wood here. Certainly some leaves contact. And it's leaving me a little flummoxed, I, I have to confess, because rosé, pale rosé, obviously made all over the world. So um, now I'm going to, I don't know, I, I might swing for the fences on this one and just see if the ball lands in or outside of the park. Well, I don't know. Who knows? It might hit a, it might hit a park car. We have no idea at this point, but you have some more time to figure that out because we're going to go to Sarah. Sarah, what are your first thoughts on wine number three? Well, you know, I was, I was almost about to choose a Provençal rosé, but then I thought, ah, oh, it's just... You know, I, I didn't go there. And then when I saw this, I thought, oh, Michael, you must have done that. And then as, as John mentioned, it, you know, it looks very much like it, but there are a lot of countries in the world, a lot of regions that are choosing to make this very popular pale uh, style. But I, I can't go to Provence here. Um, there's something, you know, Provence styles tend to be a little bit more subtle, a little bit more subdued, aromatically, a little bit more austere, where this one feels um, very vibrant. It's really thirst quenching. Um, I love that about it. Um, it's, real, it's, it's dry um, and it is uh, as an herbal note, which is what is making me think of a particular variety with herbal characters, but yet it's also really floral um, and almost like orange blossom and rose, like a muscat involved in it. So it has me a little perplexed as to the varieties and the region. It's pink, um, but that doesn't always make it easy to identify. Fantastic. Okay, so we I'm going to give you a little bit more time with that. So you have a bit more time to identify it because we're going back over to David. David, what is wine number three? Well, I'm, I'm going to be wrong anyway, likely. So I'm going to go <laughs> with, a, with a sort of a gut instinct that um, there was a rosé that passed through our tasting panel within the last month uh, that was from kind of an unusual place that I really like. So my first thought, you know, herbal is probably a Cabernet Franc based rosé, but I'm going to leave that and I'm going to go to Greece um, and maybe Agritico as the variety. Uh, and uh, it'll be a young, fresh vintage, maybe 2019. Um, I'm trying to remember which, if it was that uh, Peloponnese, where that wine was from. So now I'm seeing, I'm focused on a certain wine that I think I remember. So I'm, that's taking me down that track. Um, and um, I think it was reasonably expensive, actually. I think it was about 25, I'll say $27. Fantastic, David. Thank you so very much. Now we're going to go over to John. John, what is wine number three? 
I, I swear this is going to look really dodgy and scripted, but David, I thought the exact same thing. I thought this is that unusual rosé from Greece that we tasted recently. How else do you account for that herbal side, that tart red fruit? I mean, all of the things that we've discussed. I don't know. That's why I said I'm going to swing for the fences on this one and, and I'll go down in flames right alongside you, hopefully spectacularly, because Sarah's going to come in and sweep up the points. But um, I think the, the variety is Mavro Filero. So right. the black That's what it was. Filero, uh, the black skin filero variety, so semi-aromatic grape from the center of the Peloponnese from Mantinia. I don't think I, I don't remember what this was uh, appellated as, so I'm just going to call it Peloponnese Mavro Filero from Greece and uh, 2020. And yeah, it was about uh, $30, $29. I'm going to go $30. And it had multiple approaches there was a little m4 i think there was a little wood there was a little stainless and uh, so i'm just trying to defend myself and not just jump on david's coattails so i was already there but i'm glad we're <laughs> we'll go down together yeah. all right and we're gonna go over to sarah sarah are you uh, what what are you where are you at what what is wine number three are, are you with the boys are you going the different direction oh, well, i do i remember that it was skuras who made that and in fact i was thinking <laughs> See, we spend too much time together now is what you're going to get to get to know and we taste the same wine so we have the same things in our in our mind and yeah that was from the Peloponnese and frankly you know this this screams Cabernet Franc to me in the glass when it comes to that herbal character if it was just that I would say easily Cabernet Franc Rosé and I would even say perhaps Niagara because it is very fresh and it, um, it reminds me of something quite local. But, but it's that floral element that's just killing me and I'm sure they're right. Um, I, I, I'm very, I feel very, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but let me, let's, let's just go off. Um, and so I'm not saying the exact same thing as everybody else is doing here. Um, and even though this is green tea, just like I remember, it's not as mushroomy. So let's say, um, let's say Niagara Cabernet Franc, uh, 2020, um, $22 rosé. Am I missing anything? No, you got oh. it. You gave me you gave me a vintage. I got the vintage. We're good to go on that one. All right. So, Michael, are you ready for your big reveal? Ready? One, two, three. Go, Michael. Go. Of course, I'm ready. You guys owe me one. Oh, come on! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be <laughs> kidding me. Wow. That's a, that you know what you guys did a great job. Let's bring up the scoring wizards right away, and then we are going to get Michael to say uh, to say a little bit more about the wine. All right, scoring wizards. Okay, so I'm so sorry, Sarah. Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> I, I, I apologize, but David, you got a perfect round. Congratulations. Doesn't Just, happen often. <laughs> I know, but you know it, it does happen. You guys are really great critics, and John, I think I believe you lost a point from I think the vintage or. The price or something like that along the way and everybody the variety a, right though didn't i you there's three varieties you got in this one of them wine. you Thank got you. one of them what else that's a reminder that this is a, this is ayoritico syrah and also uh mavro filero mm -hmm. oh, okay right yeah. and then you were right john you know the the ayoritico is an acacia barrel the syrah in stainless steel tank and the mavro filero in amphora so it's a combination of the three and it, you're right, the, the layering of it and the, and the idiosyncratic nature of it and, and all those things you everybody said. And don't forget, it's also grown at some of the, these grapes at, at elevation up to 900 meters. So it's, it's really quite a, quite a curio. And uh, I had a feeling, I, and I said this before you all came on, that someone would say something that triggered it for everyone. And I know Sarah wanted to go along with it. She, in her heart, she knew <laughs> yeah. that this is what it was. Um, I wanted to see, you know, and I, this is the, you know, this isn't just about winning or, or getting points. This is about the fact that we taste together and we get through these wines and they stick with us. And I really just wanted to see how much this wine stuck with at least one person that would, that would trigger everybody's memory. And you know what? It is a really memorable wine, although I do not work with you guys outside of this. I have also tried this wine. And when I saw it come up, I was like, this is a super memorable wine. This is an awesome wine. But we do have some questions that have come in from our audience. 
And uh, the first one is, you know what? Let's 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 bring it over to Sarah. Sarah, why was this rosé third in our lineup? Why didn't we put it first? Well, it's a good question. Um, I think. You know, you could you could taste rosés first. Um, sometimes rosés, because there is often a limited amount of skin contact, have a little bit of tannic grip to them, and it might throw you off consecutively. I have to say, when we taste, for example, at the wine awards, and even when we're tasting at the office, we often taste reds before whites, or reds then whites then reds, and throw rosés in there just to get you know our palate cleanse and to and to shift gears a little bit because sometimes you know that certain characteristics of wine like tannin can be cumulative, so we try to move it around. So I mean, I, I think you probably could have if you wanted to pour this first, but um, traditionally you're pouring whites before reds, and that's what we've been doing, so that's where we went with it. Yeah, we did do a little bit of the traditional route with that one, which is totally fine. But you honestly, if you guys are at home, do whatever makes you happy. If you want to drink it in whatever order you want, unless you're into like a very structured wine tasting, it's all good. Uh, we're going to go over to John for our next question, which I, I feel like you can answer, which is our uh, uh, Malva Fiero and Mosho Fiero related. Yes, they are. Mosco, Mosco Filero and Mavro Filero, they're all in the Fileri family of indigenous Greek varieties. Mosco is a kind of pink skinned grape like Gewürztraminer or Pinot Gris when it's fully ripe. You can almost make rosé out of it, but it would be a very, very pale rosé. Mavro Filero has a slightly uh, more pigmented skin, but they're, they're aromatic varieties or semi-aromatic varieties at, at the very least. So yeah, great, great question. Obviously, somebody knows something out there. The Greek wines. Michael, you got uh, something to add? Oh, yes. Uh, and just to add to that, Mavro is the black. And in, in the Peloponnese, you have Mavro Calabrita, Mavro Filero, Mavro Daphne, you know, these, this group of, of grapes that get the word black in front of them because they're darker skin than, than other grapes. But John's right that Mavro uh, Filero is not a black, not by any stretch is, is a black. It's just of the Filero you can't grapes. make red wine out of Mavro Filero. I have, you'd have to yeah. macerate the living daylights out of it and yeah. add some and Syrah and some Ayuritico and away you, you go. You know, some, some winemakers and grapes are masochists. Who knows? Uh, just kidding. This is, my, this is my maceration joke for the day. Done. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for laughing, everyone. <laughs> All right. There we go. I got a laugh from David. Perfect. And David, the next question is going to you, which is uh, what qualities does Amphora bring into a wine? Um, that's a, a great question, and, and it's, it's worth discussing because more and more wines are coming into the market that have been aged in amphora. So these are the amphora, the ancient form of uh, sort of clay-based uh, vessels, you know, the, you, know, you know, the shape, right, with the handles and, you know, uh, so very uh, indicative of, of ancient winemaking. Uh, in some places, they would bury them in the ground. But essentially, it's a concrete container, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's inert, it's not really adding much flavor at all, it's, it mo it's more a textural um, element that it's bringing to the wine, and you may get a, some sense of cement or clay, a little bit of minerality in the wines as well, but it's, it's inert, uh, and it, it, the, its main uh, benefit actually is keeping temperatures low, you know, so the wines are aging uh, and staying fresher longer, but uh, more and more people are experimenting with them, uh, and it's kind of fun to watch. It is. It's really cool. And I have a, one last question over for Michael. Michael, there are these really great regions that make rosé around the world. We've already said Provence. One that didn't come up is uh, the Montepulciano di Abruzzo rosés, the Cerespolos that are there as well. We just, just You just showed us one amazing one from Greece. But there's many rosés around the world. This is a more of a general rosé question, which is can rosés be cellared or are they just meant to be drunk right away? I, I would say that 99% of rosé made on this planet are meant to be consumed. Uh, that's really the number one reason to make rosé. Consumed in what period of time? This is an example that we, we just tasted now that, you know, the, the last line of my review when I tasted this wine was, this can get more curious and interesting over time. What good reason could there be not to want to see where this goes, right? It's already... A curiosity. So with a little bit of age, especially knowing that 
that Barrel was involved and Amphora was involved, you know, two, three, five years down the road, it's going to become something even more. It may not be something you like necessarily at that time, but it's going to become something more complex and more interesting. So, uh, yes, there are rosés made that uh, that can be aged. Yeah, I there definitely are. And I know that just to let out all of our audience know, I know that all of you have been asking for food pairings. What I'm gonna do at the end is ask each and every single one of our critics that selected their wines for a food pairing for their wines and they will give it to you. So we're just, just gonna put that all at the end everybody because we are getting on for wine at number four. Sarah staying back with me. We got Michael, John and David, if you guys can showcase your little bottles here, we're gonna send you off to the critics lounge apparently very quickly. So just pour that into your glasses and uh, we are going to get the screen sharing going. Hi, Sarah. I'm also having to pour into my glasses. Okay, this time. they're all out of here, right? So I can they're show all, them. You wine. don't have to actually show them because I'm oh. going to share my screen, which has a beautiful Perfect. picture of your wine on it. They are all out of here. And I have to say, this is one of my favorite wines. So can oh, you please? Great. Yeah, can okay. you please tell the, the audience what, what they're looking at? Just the stats as well. And you could say why you picked it. Yeah, so this is from Chateau La Nerf. This is a, a winery that's located um, very close to a region that's near and dear to me in the southern Rhone. And um, this is not far from Avignon. It's just a little bit further north around the city of Orange. Now, I think that the guys might go this way because they know, you know, I spend quite a bit of time there and I went to school there and it's an area that I, I love and I, I work with a lot. Um, so this is a, a Cote d'Aron village. Now, to me, this was like a little bit of a, a baby Chateau Neuf du Pape. I didn't pick the Chateau Neuf du Pape because it was about twice as expensive and I didn't really want uh, anybody to, <laughs> to break the bank on it. But this one has got tremendous amount of value. I think one of the things that they'll guess is the fact that it's got a little bit higher in alcohol. Now it's a blend of Syrah, uh, sorry, Grenache, Syrah and Mourvedre and like many of the reds in the Southern Rhone, it's Grenache heavy, it's highest in its percentage um, of, of Grenache in particular. So, um, and it's about 60%. So let's see if they get this wine. This is one of the oldest wi wineries in the Southern Rhone in the Chateau Neuf du Pape region. And hopefully they get that it's 2018 as well and $24.95 for the price. So we're going to bring them back in. I'm very excited about this. And remember, everyone, to just please do not give any quest answers away in the chat. It's our last one. You also guys are going to see another poll come up soon. So let's let's get through this. This is going to be amazing. Critics, welcome back. Can you please unmute yourselves? Because uh, we got a lot going on for our last one. And I am going to go to Michael first. Michael. What are your first thoughts on wine number four? First thought is thanks a lot, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> no idea what's going on here. Oh. <laughs> okay. There's so much going on. This is a beautifully complex wine. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased with it. My first thought was that it's kind of dusty, peppery. There's like this cured salumi character to it. I thought there was some age on it, you know, oak aged, but all kinds of different barrels involved. But then I put it, you know, put it on my palate and it's fresher and, and, and that pepperiness is more vibrant than I thought. And, and it takes me to kind of a new world feel. And so I'm completely in a confounded space right now. So hopefully my other colleagues will help me get out of this funk. We will see how they can help you or not help you. So David, what are your first thoughts on wine number four? Well, first thought was, and this kind of goes to the process that we're involved here. And um, at first, I didn't get much nose, much aromatic, and 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 it smelled quite mature and, and almost a little bit oxidative. And it took about a minute in the glass before for it to come alive. So that that interim period, I'm still thinking about it. Um, but it is a uh, it's fairly mature, but the color doesn't show that. Um, there's a fair bit of oak here. It's kind of midweight, medium full body. Tannins are are still quite prevalent, but they're not green and austere. Uh, it's leaving this, this sort of dusty impression uh, of the wine. And the fruit is actually, once it opens up and gets a little bit of air, the fruit is still quite uh, for, uh, you know, fresh and, and very much a part of the mix. So I mean, my, my impressions were changing by the second as the wine was actually being exposed to air. But it's a very good wine. Fantastic thoughts, David. And we're gonna go over to John. John, what are your first thoughts on wine number four? 
you know, it might be the uh, atmospheric pressure out here in Prince Edward County, but this wine for me is singing. This wine is in a glorious place. I mean, from the moment I poured it into my glass, it was like, ah, oh, I feel so comforted. I feel, I feel at home. And I said, thank you, Sarah, for bringing us back to a place we'd all like to be traveling in right now, or at least what I imagine uh, this wine would, would be from. Meaty black licorice, black currants. Got that wonderful walk through, you know, some Mediterranean scrub after a summer rain with some lavender and some thyme and some resinous herbs, as I call them. And great, great balance. Lots of sapidity, lots of succulents. This little scorched earth minerality showing through. Tannins are pretty comfortable. You know, I think they've had a couple of years to resolve. Wood for me is not a, a factor. You know, it's probably a, a big old barrel or old or smaller barrels. Anyhow, it's, it's a background note. This is all about the savory fruit and the terrific balance. You know, great acids, very, very succulent, very sapid, as I keep saying. My, my mouth is sal salivating at the moment. So, John's yeah. enjoying this anyway. so much. He doesn't, he can't stop talking. It's it, that, that's how you know when a critic likes something. All right. So, we are going to go over to Michael. Michael, what is wine number four? Did I mention, thank you, Sarah. Okay, so I'm gonna go out on a limb here and go far away because I can't shake it. And I think this is a Shiraz, it could be Shiraz blend. It could be some Grenache in here, but I'm gonna say Shiraz. Uh, I think it's from Australia. I'll just say generally speaking, South Australia. I think it's from the 2019 vintage and um, I can't decide whether this is one of those $20, $25 wines or whether it's, you know, up there. It's tastes to me like a $35 wine, but I think it's something that punches above its weight. So I'm going to say $21. Fantastic. Thank you so very much. And we're going to go over to David. David, what is wine number four? Okay. I don't know exactly. So <laughs> this is, this is a bit, I'm sorry, a bit man. Guesswork. Time is up. You got to right. tell me. All right. So, yeah, I mean, Stylistically and regionally, it could be a lot of different things. Uh, there is some age on it uh, so, um, that, that makes it harder to actually pick out the exact variety. So I, I see where you're going with Shiraz, uh, but I don't think that's it. Um, I'm going to go to Spain. Uh, I'm going to go to Tempranillo. Uh, and I'm going to, I don't think it's Rioja. It's got a bit too much weight and it's sort of softer and fleshier. Uh, so I'm going to go to Ribera del Duero. Uh, I'm going to go to, again, it's got some maturity, but there's still some fruit. Um, and so I'm going to go kind of mid 2000 or 2010, maybe I'll say 2015. So uh, for the vintage and price about $25. Thank you so very much, David. And we're going over to John. John, what is wine number four? Wine number four is a delicious Grenache based blend from France, from the Southern Rhone. And like Michael, I mean, for me, this tastes like, a, like an expensive wine, but for some reason, I think it's just a terrific value because I know how D'Amato's mind works. She's always seeking great value wines and, you know, conscious of the money that people have to spend to join in and, and play with us. So it's not a $50 Chateau Neuf du Pape, although it could be. I mean, it certainly tastes like that, but I think it's a Cote de Rhone village in the sort of mid 20s. So I'm going to call it straight up 25 from a vintage that was warm, but not too hot a, a few years ago, 2017, but not old. For me, it just kind of fits right into that. And even if it's not, it should be because that's what it tastes like. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone. Sarah, are you ready for your big reveal? Go for it. Do it. All right, guys. Lots of very good guesses. And ah. this is indeed, as you mentioned, John, this is the Lanerf uh, Les Castagnes Côte de Village from 2018, organically made. Um, it's, it, I mean, I was saying the exact same thing, John, behind there about the fact that it's good value and I could have oh, chosen no, the Chateau Neuf. It's almost like you knew exactly what she was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you're, you're echoing. But I also want to say that, you know, often 
I think a lot of the flavor characteristics are right on with Rioja, oftentimes Tempranillo is, is uh, garnachas blended together and a lot of similar kind of meaty aromatic characteristics. So completely and let's dive flavorful. into that in just a moment. Yeah. I'm just gonna bring up the scoring wizard really quickly to see how you guys did this round. All right, so this round, uh, we got John with nine points for the round. David, you have scored zero and uh, Michael, you have scored zero and Sarah, you got one point for hair, which is now its own <laughs> column. So okay. um, you scored an extra point, even yeah. though you couldn't score points this round for hair. So I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong column. Michael, you got four points. John, you got nine. David, you got one. I was reading the hair column and only one person got <laughs> scored in that. Uh, sorry about the, the fake out yeah, I appreciate the token. <laughs> Very good. All right. And, and that means our winner for the evening is John. In second place, we have David and then followed by Michael and Sarah. Thank you very much, Scoring Wizard. You can come off the screen now. And Sarah, can you, you can please continue your point? How, uh, yeah, this, this wine does share everything that our critics said. There was a lot of reminiscentness in the wine from different places around the world. And that's the difficult thing with the, the South of France productions, especially in the Rome, because they are blends. It reminds you of other blends from other places that are done well. So please continue. Oh, we haven't had a lot of Rome wines on the show. So I was uh, excited to bring that. And I know these guys know it's kind of near and dear to me. Um, Michael, you were right on with that Syrah because that peppery characteristic really comes out quite a bit in this wine and it could be the dominant grape almost. It's about 60% Grenache, 30% Syrah and 10% Mourvedre um, from an old estate. And um, there is uh, there there is a kind of traditional charm about it too, but they're also known for some of their more modern winemaking uh, production styles. So, you know, it, it could be tricky to nail it. Thank you so very much, Sarah. So I know that we've had some questions come in. I'm gonna ask them to our wonderful critics. And I know that we had some questions come for who won the season. So I've already text messaged the scoring wizard and then we're gonna see how they do with that within you know the next uh, five minutes. So let's, let's see how they do and give them some time. <laughs> Why not? Uh, I feel like five minutes is enough to get through the 12 episodes that we have now done. So we'll see how they do on that. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a, a question come up first um, and I'm going to go throw this one over to John because you made a specific point about this. How do you pinpoint vintage in this, in these tastings? Ah, terrific question and not an easy answer. Oh, oh, great. Simple questions with complex answers. I mean, you have to kind of reverse engineer once you think you know what the wine is, the variety in the region, then you have to delve into your sort of database, your memory of what the vintage characteristics were like in each of those areas and how the wine should be presenting at this point in time or, or how that vintage would be showing at this point in time. So uh, I'd love to say there's some magic formula, but you know, a 10 year old Barolo is, is, you know, maybe as mature as a, a three-year-old Lange Nebbiolo, just to give you an example, just the evolutionary curve is different for each wine. So I don't know, you just need to taste a lot and get lucky uh, an awful lot of the time too. So what John is saying is just keep drinking more wine and figure out what the vintage is and remember what that is as you're drinking it. And uh, this is why people work in wine for a living. We drink and think, which is fun. Um, so I'm going to get my next question to go over to David, David, because it is specifically directed towards you, David, David, you said that there are stems are evident in this wine. What did you mean? I say stems. Apparently you said stems are evident in this wine. Um, mm. our, our audience is very engaged. Yes. <laughs> they, they really uh, I don't to think, I actually said. don't think I said that. Um, but if stems were evident, um, it would be because they've had left some stems in the in the vats during the fermentation, which is not done so much anymore, but they used to do that to sort of give a bit more toughness and tannin to the wine back in the day. Uh, and, and it would make the wine more tannic and gritty and perhaps even green. But um, these these tannins don't remind me of that at all. Um, they're, they're, they're more sort of softer tannins. Uh, there's a, they're fairly, they're, they're very evident, but they're not green tannins. They're not stemmy tannins. 
fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Uh, and I'm gonna, I, I'm actually gonna direct this question to Michael. I know that it's directed to John, but John already answered a question. Michael hasn't answered one yet. And you know, he said something similar. So the question is, what are the markers that point to, that point that would point you to a GSM from Roan or a GSM from Australia? You said Australia, so this is equally as fitting. Sure. So it's a really good question because, quite frankly, the lines are getting more and more blurred with every passing year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the original the original formula was for Australian winemakers to do what was done in the Rhone. There's a reason why Syrah and Grenache, Mourvedre, especially Grenache and Syrah, are grown so so rampantly in Australia and have been for so long. Um, and they're they're you know they they're mimicking what came first, right? But the lines are blurred. So you know, agriculture has changed. Uh, adapting to climate change is, is, is really changes everything. And I'm finding more and more over the last couple of years, Australian wines being fresher and having an old world sentimentality to them and not being these jammy fruit bombs that they had been for, for a few decades, right? Um, and that, the other side of that is, is French winemakers trying to make fresher wines that are more amenable early on and don't necessarily have to be cellared and especially at certain price points. So Sarah said it. Lanert makes some some very modern style wines, right? So, um, what are the markers? But, uh, sunshine, you know, right? Yes. Like sunshine is is the number one marker for 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 what is what what the wine is, where it's from, and what year it might be from. More than anything. I think that's a really great answer. And it is it is quite difficult to figure out because don't forget everyone that one of the major factors of terroir and sense of place is people. People make choices all the time, and that really does affect how something is going to come out in the glass. All right, so I have a, another question that's coming up, and then we're going to get into our final question of the evening. And I'm going to get, give this one to Sarah because you picked this wine. And the question is, what is the difference between Cote de Rhone and Cote de Rhone village? Right, so um, there are a number of named villages in the Cote Rhone, and those villages could appear on the label. Um, but then there is a level of Cote Rhone village where um, a larger number of villages can be used to, um, where grapes are grown, can be blended together to produce a wine that is Cote de Rhone village. Right, so it's a step up from your basic Cote de Rhone. It's not quite uh, one that comes entirely from one name village um, and um, it's not a crew which would be the highest level like Chateau Neuf du Pape or, um, or Rusto for example. So it's um, in the uh, it's, it's a step above your basic Cote d'Iron level. So it usually commands a slightly higher price and um, you get a little bit more concentration and longevity. I think that's a great thing that that you can start looking for in wines and you really laid it out perfectly. This is what you should be looking for when you're cellaring wine. What that longevity that can be there is based on sense of place. It's also based on its level of acidity and tannins and what's really can hap happening in the glass. So this is all part of cellaring wine. That's also me answering a question that kind of came in. And uh, it also depends as you're drinking these wines. I know you guys have all been enjoying them from different wine glasses at home and please play around with it. We did have one of our, our audience members say that they tried it in a Bordeaux and they tried it in a Burgundy, which is definitely going to change the way that you are experiencing the wine. But we're gonna get to our last and most asked question of the evening. But before we do so, our scoring wizard says that we weren't keeping track this season. I'm so sorry about that. Um, but uh, everybody won equally and we will probably do that next season so if that's what you'd like to hear please stick around we'll have season eight and we'll keep track so that's something that we can always improve on in the future but everybody won equally so just we're gonna we're going for we're going for that this season everyone gets a prize everyone gets a prize <laughs> and, it's, and guess what it's a bottle of wine yeah. So uh, for all of our critics in the order that you guys presented in this evening, what would you like to pair with your wine? David, you're first. Well, uh, one of my uh, great meals that I had, it was very early on in my career. Uh, it was my first time in Paris on a wine trip. I was heading off, but I had my first night in Paris and I found this wonderful seafood uh, restaurant. And I don't remember where it was. I was just ambling along. And uh, there was no one there. I must have been, I must have been too early. It was probably 
eating at six o'clock Canadian time, not nine o'clock. Uh, so I went to this restaurant and, um, and saw this wonderful seafood and there was a bottle of Sancerre on the, on the list. And I bought the whole bottle and I drank it myself, uh, the only one in the restaurant and really one of the great memories of, of my wine career. So uh, seafood folks, uh, locally, uh, obviously goat cheese um, is a goat cheese. Chev is a, is a, a local match for Sancerre as well. But uh, make, uh, make it great seafood, but not too strong, just mellow. It's perfect with it. And you're honestly making me hungry. I feel like all of you guys are gonna make me hungry with all of your answers. Uh, John, what, are, what would you like to pair with your wonderful Gruner Veltliner this evening? We had Michael's pairing before, which was asparagus. So please don't say asparagus. No, I mean, that, that, that's a great one. And it's, it is one of the few wines that, that works well with asparagus, green and white. But, you know, uh, it's such a versatile wine, Gruner Vetliner. Uh, but this one is a little bit richer. I would go in the direction of Southeast Asia. I'd actually like to see a, a green curry with this, with uh, a meatier, more oily fish, a sable fish or a black cod, something of that nature, where you're involving all of the lemongrass and ginger and, and pungency of the dish that has its equal in the glass and the same sort of creamy texture. I like to match on body and, you know, a, a rich green curry has a lot of body, but you can find the similar body in this Grunovat Lina, which also has its little green herbal kind of, um, I call it lentil-like flavor, you know, this uh, not root vegetable, a bit root vegetable, but uh, this, these pulses, this flavor of pulses. Uh, I think it works quite well. Body goes with body, everybody. You heard it from John Zabel. All <laughs> right, <laughs> we're gonna go over to Michael. Michael, what would you like to pair with your rosé this evening? So, I mean, I'd like to pair it with some kind of Peloponnese cuisine, Greek food for sure, but that's not what I'm making tonight. So I'm going a little off track tonight. And so bear with me, but we have this favorite pizza place that we, um, that we like to share when we're at the office tasting and when we're all there together. And that hasn't happened in a while. It's a place called Capi's in, in Etobicoke. And they make this umami sauce, which they call bombini. Okay, bear with me. It's a calabresi bomba. It's a spicy vegetable spread. It's got, it's oozing with umami. And I saved one of those sort of three ounce containers and it lasts forever. The stuff never goes bad. So tonight, before I came on, I made a, a sort of biryani mix of very finely julienne carrots and onion and celery and garlic. And I fried it up and then I mixed it into, into a rice, into dried rice with a little bit of olive oil and, and some, a little bit of spices, nothing East, you know, nothing South Asian, but anyway, so the biryani part is just sort of the style of, of cooking, okay? And I added this three ounce bom, uh, bombini into it. So wow, you really made some fusion at home. Yes, yeah, some fusion. So it's like a biryani, bombini, a rice pilaf, and then I've got some shrimps that are, that are marinating and I'm gonna grill them and then put them on top of the rice peel on that with this idiosyncratic rosé, you got it. Perfect. And that sounds like a great dish that you can make vegetarian as well with all of you that could. going on. So if you would like to make Michael's fusion food, get this rosé to pair with it. Uh, How long does an Uber take to get to your house, Michael? Yes, <laughs> From your place, 10 minutes, David. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, so we're going to go over to Sarah. Sarah, what would you like to pair with the Chateau Laneau that you've showed us this evening? And it rhymed. Wow, that rhymed. That's nice. What would well, you like you to know, I think I might be outside um, Michael's backyard with a plate and a mask saying, please, sir, please, sir, fill my plate. <laughs> um, but I, this wine really brings me to North Africa. And, you know, there's really close proximity between the south of France and and North Africa. Um, in fact, um, there's a lot of North African culture and especially in terms of restaurants that you can find in the south of France, a lot of couscouseries um, and street kebabs. And I'm thinking actually of a kebab and be a kefta, um, a grilled skewered beef and lamb on a skewer, maybe with a little fresh parsley or mint, definitely a little bit of garlic or a, a, um, uh, some some uh, grilled onions there. Um, I think this would be a really great match for this wine. Now it's not an overly tannic wine. There is a little bit of tannic grip, but you don't have to worry about getting, getting too, too heavy on the salty protein. So if you wanted to do like a vegetarian dish, um, I'm thinking uh, a French ratatouille, 
from from the area and uh, with some some great uh, local herbs and don't forget a little bit of garlic not too much it'll overwhelm but you know once it's italian dish are roasted it'll soften and sweeten and it'll be a nice match for this wine I think that's absolutely delicious. You guys have provided some amazing pairings. I know that we've had some other questions that have come in this evening and hopefully we've answered them all for you guys. But I can see all the love flooding in through the chat. We are so happy that all 400 of you have been with us here tonight. It's been absolutely amazing to end this, uh, this season on such a wonderful episode where our critics have taken over. Uh, but thank you all critics for joining us this evening and thank you audience. Thank you everyone. And we will see you again soon. There's also more stuff happening with Wine Alliance. So you'll see everybody again soon. Cheers, everybody. Have a great summer, everyone. We'll be back to normal. Looking forward to seeing you all again. Thank you all. Thank you all. Cheers, Davis, everybody. Uh, yeah. John, thank you, Renee. Thank you. And thank you, Scoring Wizard. Yeah, Renee, great job, Renee. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everybody. Oh, Ciao. Fun. Thank you, Brian and Sarah behind the scenes. And Alexandra. <laughs> yes, our whole Wine Align team, which is Brian, Sarah, Alexandra, all of the critics that you see here. And I'm, I'm adding myself to that too. But thank you, everyone. Cheers, everybody, and good night. Good night, good night all.